All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so are there any, uh, does anyone have any questions about what we covered um, uh, at the end of yesterday afternoon so far about object-oriented programming? Um, anything, I know that the end it was a little bit fast, yes. Basically, um, that's the basic idea, yes, is that, um, yeah, so methods are essentially just uh, functions that are specialized to a particular, to a particular class, and, um, and they typically, and in R at least, they belong essentially to some sort of um, generic function. So here the generic function is speak, so you can call all of the speak methods just by using speak. Um, so speak will behave differently and find the correct method um, depending on what kind of um, class of object you give to it. Um, any other questions um, that I can review on the material from yesterday afternoon? I'm going to go after, um, I'm going to go over this uh, ex example with S3 and S4 on proteomics data um, that we started and if there aren't any other um, questions. Okay, so uh, uh, yesterday we finished up talking about, we are we were just starting to talk about this S3 class for proteomics data. So the basic idea here is We've been using a um, just a regular table or a data frame so far for all of our um, example analyses with the tidyverse that Sung Heng um, showed to us. So, what uh, what would be interesting is if we had a class that behaved like a data frame or like a regular table, except we could we knew that it was specifically holding proteomics data, so we could define methods specifically for it, depending because we know what kind of columns to expect. We know there's a protein column, a peptide column, a run column, an intensity column, things like that. Um, so then we can uh, define methods specifically for this class, um, and we don't have to worry, uh, and we can assume that they're going to do what they're supposed to do. So here we're going to create a protexp uh, class for, it's an S3 class for uh, proteomics data, and it's a relatively simple class. It's just going to inherit from um, data frame and table. So here, this is our constructor function. So we're going to take as arguments uh, vectors for protein, feature, run, intensity, and um, some sort of label. And then we're going to use this dot, dot, dot argument that allows users to pass in any additional number of arguments that they want. And this dot, dot, dot will just, um, whatever the user passes in there will just end up as additional columns in our special proteomics data frame. Um, and then lastly, we have one more argument called uh, islog2 that is just a Boolean or logical um, that, that um, tells us whether this particular data set has had its intensities log2 transformed or not. Um, so one thing, one thing I want to note about this, this construction here while we're at it is, so you'll notice that here I have all of these um, protein feature run intensity label. I have these parameters first, then I have this uh, dot 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 argument where the user can pass in any um, additional number of arguments that they want. And then I have this is log two um, parameter at the end of that, um, and what that does is whenever you have a function in R and you have um, and you want to execute it, R will actually um, partially do partial matching on most of the parameters. So. This, it's not necessarily a good idea to actually take advantage of this because you typically want to be as precise as you can when you program, but it is um, something to be aware of. So here, for example, I have a function called foo. It just prints out an argument that I give to it. 
Um, it just has a single parameter, A, B, C, and um, so here if I just pass in 5, there's only one argument, so I'm just going to assume this A, B, C is 5, and it will print 5. Um, but R will actually do partial matching on parameters for functions. So I can actually just do foo A, B equals 1 or 10, and R will be able to figure out that this A, B means the ABC parameter that I have. I can, actually, I can also just do A and so forth. Let's make this a little bit more complicated. So here I have two parameters, ABC and ABBC. So here if I just give enough to disambiguate, I can put on, um, oops. That'll get partially matched to this ABBC argument. And the special, there's, there's a special significance of having um, any arguments that come after the dot, dot, dot in a function signature. So here, I'll have an X, I'll have a Y, and I'll have a Z. And so, well, here, I have an x and y, I have a dot, 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 which can be any additional number of arguments, and I have z. And this function, it prints x, it prints y, and it prints z. And we already know that we don't actually have to name all of the arguments that we pass to a function. That's optional. Um, so here I'm going to try to um, do foo with x equals 1, y equals 2, uh, y equals 3. But we can see when I try to do that here, I got... Um, x printed as 1, y printed as 2, but then when the function went to print z, argument z was missing, even though I have that third argument here in the function signature. Does anyone know why that is? Yeah. Exactly. So if you have... Uh, uh, dot 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 like this in the function signature. Any arguments that you put, um, that you have, any formal arguments that you have after the dot 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 have to be um, have to be uh, specified explicitly whenever a user calls that function um, by name. So here, I can specify x and y just by having any two arguments. Those will just match based on the position of the arguments. But in order to specify z, I actually have to explicitly name z equals 3. Otherwise, that third argument will get swallowed up by the dot, dot, dot. Um, so here to get this to work, um, z equals 3. And so there's multiple reasons for that. One reason that you might want to do that is any, um, any parameters that you may not typically use and you want the user to be really, really sure they actually want to use these, it might be a good idea to put those after this special dot, dot, dot um, argument. And another reason, which is the main reason we're doing it here, is you may want to allow any number of additional arguments and treat those arguments in a specific way, um, in the same way that you treat the arguments before it but then have some other arguments that are treated completely differently from those. So here, protein, feature, run, intensity, label, um, these are all going to end up as columns in our data frame. Um, and the same thing is true for any arguments that are passed in this dot, dot, dot here. Um, this argument, though, this is love trans equals false, that's just true or false. Um, so we don't want to run into a situ situation where a user tries to specify this by passing in a false somewhere in here, and then the true false ends up as, as a random column in the data frame or something like that.
And we can see the same thing is true with um, our zone our zone built-in data frame function. So here, there is it starts off with a dot 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 argument, and all of these are just um, the columns that end up in the actual data frame. And essentially, all of the special um, parameters that change how that data frame is constructed are arguments that come after the dot dot dot. Because here, with, when you're making a data frame, most of the time you just want to use the dot the that dot 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 to just um, pass in whatever arguments that you want to, that will be um, columns in the data frame. So I just wanted to quickly point out what was going on there. So here I'm checking if the user actually passed in any additional columns. If so, I'm going to pass those to my data frame uh, function when I create my data frame. And if not, I'm just not going to leave those out. Um, so I'm going to turn, create a data frame um, with those protein feature run intensity label columns. Um, I'm going to turn it into a tibble, and I'm going to assign that to an object. Um, one reason I'm doing it like this, I'm making a data frame first and then coercing it to a tibble. Uh, you may be wondering why. And that's because we saw the other day that uh, with tibbles, it's actually really easy to have um, list columns. So tibbles, if I tried to do this as a tibble, this list, it would actually end up as a separate column when, in fact, what I want is I want every element of this list to be a separate column. And that's how a data frame behaves, um, which is a little bit different from how the tibble um, constructor behaves. So that's why I'm doing that. So I end up with this object, which is currently a tibble. I'm adding an attribute for is log2, uh, for whether it's log2 transformed, and then I'm modifying the class attribute with this class uh, function. I'm going to make its class this protexp uh, S3 class, and that's going to inherit from all of the classes that the object already has. And this will be um, a tibble and a data frame. Yes? Why do you have to like get else if the list is empty and it gets passed, or maybe it's not empty? Like if, if it were empty and it got passed to the end of that, and it was just nothing, and you could just sort of not have to get else. Right. So here, um, yeah, here because of the way I'm doing this, um, actually, the, the might be an easier way to do this. The way I'm doing it this way is because I'm passing it as this list like this. And so if the dot, dot, dot is empty, there's just going to be a random uh, empty list in there, and beta frame will be confused. Um, now that you asked that, it's there might have been a reason I didn't do this, do it this way, but that I might have just not seen it. I might have just not seen it. It might just be easier to do it this way. We'll see if uh, we'll see if this works. So. Um, before I was I was um, turning that list of dot 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 arguments into a list, but I can also just pass them directly to the data frame constructor, um, and that might be an easier way to do it. Yes. So, because you're um, making this a class pro exp, but it also inherits from data frame and table. Mm -hmm. Can this be used directly for all of your GC plot figures? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So this is so this is a um, it's going to be a, a class protexp, but it's also going to be a class tibble and data frame. So any any functions that already work on data frames will also work on this. Yes. Um, let me go ahead and try that and see if that works. So here, this is this function is our constructor. So we have this protexp function that will create this protexp object. Um, we'll go ahead and do this print method now too. So who can uh, remember what this uh, next method function does in this um, in this print method? At the very end of yesterday afternoon, yes. It prints the rest of the data as it would have been printed, just with the cat Right, basically. So yeah, so this next method, we're, we'll just call the next method that would have been called for this class's uh, super class. So um, here we're going to, um, whenever we want to print a protexp uh, object, first it'll go into this method, 
and um, print out a proteomics experiment. Um, and then um, this uh, next method will execute, and that means to go find the next method that would have been called if, um, if we didn't find this method first. So that means it's going to use the regular print method for um, tipples or data frames. So I'll go ahead and add that. I'm going to skip ahead to creating our first, to testing the constructor out. So here I'm just loading uh, the data. We're expecting a, uh, a label column and, an, and a single intensity column. So if you remember, our original data set has um, an intensity heavy and an intensity light column. Um, so we're just going to use a couple tidyverse functions to change that around. So that we have a single, a single intensity column, and then another column for labeling whether that intensity is heavy or light. And now we'll go. In, we'll test that constructor. So here, just passing that protein feature right intensity label, and then the rest of these pairs, zygosity, subject, and visit. These are additional arguments that will um, go through that dot dot dot. So, it's, so that works. I'm going to make sure it still works if there's no additional arguments. That works as well. Yeah, so, so doing it this way was definitely um, a little bit easier than the if else statement. I don't remember exactly why I did it the other way first. <laughs> Okay, so we're creating a protexp object and assign it to, assigning, assigning it to the variable exp1. And if we print that, you'll see it'll first find our print method. It'll just print a proteomics experiment, and then it'll go find the next method. Um, so it'll print do the regular tibble printing method and print out the first um, 10 lines here. Okay, let's go take a look at the other methods we have. So since we have this um, attribute for whether the intensities have been log to transformed or not, uh, we need some methods that will actually access that attribute and set it if we want. Um, and that's because, well, it's an attribute. Um, so we could potentially just expect the user to always do something like this and look at the, the attribute using the uh, attribute function. But that's not quite as user friendly as actually having a method dedicated to getting and setting this attribute. So first, we're going to create um, generic functions for whether the, whether um, some particular data set is, is log to transformed or not. And so remember to create an S3 generic function. We just um, create a function, and the only um, thing in the body of that function is a call to the use method function, and then the name of the, of the generic function that we want to use. So first, this is going to be the generic function that accesses this attribute. And this is going to be the generic function that allows us to set the attribute. Um, so you'll notice one thing that a looks a little bit funky here is we have this actual um, assignment operator as part of the, the name. And this is, this is one of the ways that you can um, create functions that allow assignments. So we saw earlier that there's lots of different um, There's lots of different times that we actually use a function to assign things. So here we can use this class function both to get the class of an object, and we also use it when we want to assign the class of the object. And I'm sure you've seen other functions that behave similarly to this, such as the um, dimensions or names attribute of, of objects. So we want to, and these are called um, replacement functions when we use 
the version of the function that allows us to replace um, some sort of value. So the way we create replacement functions like this is um, basically the name just has uh, this assignment operator at the end of it. And another thing you'll notice is that I've had to surround this name, the name of this uh, variable, with backticks. And that's the way to kind of um, escape things in R and let you use special symbols as names rather than as how those symbols usually behave. So for example, if you um, ever needed to look up the help page for um, addition, you might try to do it, doing it like this. That's not really going to work. So if you want to look up the help page for the plus sign, you can surround the plus in these backticks, and that will find it for you. Likewise, for um, say we wanted help for how to create for loops in R, well, the word for is a special um, is a special word in R, so trying to look it up like that isn't going to work. So if we surround it with, um, if we quote it in these back ticks, that tells R that we're actually trying to use it as the name rather than um, what it, rather than how it's usually um, executed. So that, looking it up that way, it gets us to the help page for um, for loops as well as other control control flow words. So here we're making these um, generic functions for accessing and um, setting the is log two attribute. And in this particular case, um, we're just going to create the default methods rather than method specific to our class because um, it's pretty, I think it's um, pretty common that if another, if someone were to create another class that, ha that has, um, that wants to check whether the data has been is log two transformed or not, um, just having an attribute called is log two is a pretty reasonable, pretty um, common way that people might do that. So we're just going to create um, these as default methods. The first just gets the attribute called is log two, and the second one um, replaces the attribute called is log two with a new value, and then returns the returns the new object. So that's one thing to note about these um, replacement functions. So um, here, the accessor function just takes, uh, it's just taking a single argument, the object itself. The replacement version takes both an object as well as a value to replace it with. So um, this value will also end up um, on the right-hand side being whatever is being replaced, or it, whatever is, um, whatever value it is to, be re to replace the original value. And then, um, so here we're assigning the value to that um, object attribute, and then we actually have to return the new object. And that's a little, that's an important thing to remember. So we can't actually just do this, because then um, this, this object in here, remember, um, all, essentially everything in R is immutable. So this object is going to, when we modify this object, it's going to be a different object than the one back in our global environment or wherever we happen to run this function. So we actually need to um, return the new object itself as part of the replacement function. Yes? Do you have to require that is log two is the result? So with, so with, um, that would be a good thing to check here. Yes, that would be a good thing to check. So let's go ahead and do that. So I'm just going to check if um, the length of value is 1. It, so if the, if the length of value is not 1, or if it's not a logical type, then we'll say stop value must be a length one logical vector. Yeah, so that's a very good thing to check. And the one thing 
uh, to remember is that with S3, there's no real way to confirm that in the object or in the class itself. So if we want to do any checking like that, we would have to do it in these replacement functions. Um, we would have, yeah, we have to check those in there. With S4, um, we can actually build that into the, ob into the class itself, um, have that as part of the validity function so that we wouldn't have to check this in every single replacement method that we might make. All right, so let's make those. We'll create a normalize method. So we'll create a uh, normalize generic function. And then here, this is essentially just doing the median normalization that uh, Tsung Heng presented earlier. I'm not going to walk through that right now. And we'll create a summary function. And we'll say our version of a summary for this object just um, basically sums up the sums up the intensities for each protein for each run. Um, you can probably come up with a more interesting or reasonable summary, but we're going to say that's our summary. And summary is already uh, an S3 generic function, so we don't have to create our own generic function there. And lastly, we'll create a, pl a plot method. We'll say by default, if we say we want to plot this object, um, we're just going to make box plots of the distribution of intensities for each run. Seems reasonable enough for a default. So now we have all of those. We already have our exp1, uh, our, our product exp object. You can see it prints with the R method. We can do normalization. If I do summary on it, I'll get the sums of the intensities for each protein for each run. That ends up as a huge array um, that we're not going to look at. And I can also plot it. The box plots here are kind of tiny, but the, the method works. All right. Any questions on that? Okay, so now we'll quickly go through the S4 example. So for the S4 example, I thought rather than basically redoing the same thing we did with S3 but with S4, um, we're going to do something a little bit more complicated. So um, if you don't have the summarized experiment uh, package installed, this is these lines will install it. But we're going to use that summarized experiment package that uh, Vince Carey was talking about during, during our keynote. And so this, this, pack, this is a package available on Bioconductor. It implements a very generic class called Summarized Experiment, which is, uh, which is an S4 class that is rather generically ac applicable to many types of complex biological, biological experiments. And so if you recall what a summarized experiment looks like. So a summarized experiment will have um, let's see. Um, should have had a um, so a summarized experiment will look a little bit different than our ordinary data frames so far. A summarized experiment um, expects the, our intensities to be in a matrix format where each column is, is a single run or a single sample, and each row is a feature. Um, so very different format from the tidy format we've been using so far. Um, it's going to have a matrix format of intense, a matrix of intensities where each column is a run or sample and each row is a feature. And then we have two additional data frames of metadata where one of those data frames corresponds to the columns, that is, 
there's one uh, data frame that corresponds to all of the metadata for all of the runs or samples, and then a separate data frame that corresponds to all of the metadata for all of the features. And so that means we're going to have to do a little bit of cleaning um, to make our data end up in the right format. But first, we're going to create um, our own proteomics experiment class um, for S4 classes. That means we are going to formally define it in a call to set class. Um, the name is going to be ProEXP, just capitalized. Um, it's going to inherit from this summarized experiment class, and it's going to have one additional slot. So the set class uh, slots are how this slots argument are how we define what uh, slots are in the are in the class. But we only need if we're inheriting from another class, we only need to specify any new slots that the parent classes don't already have. So this will automatically inherit all of the slots that summarize experiment already has. So we only have to specify the new ones, and that's going to be uh, an is log two slot, and we can say that is going to be logical. And as we ended up doing in the replacement method for our is log two um, accessor, uh, I didn't check that here. We're going to have a validity function, and I'll go ahead and add one, a part of it that checks the length of that is log two slot. Okay, so here we're creating a validity function that checks the object and makes sure it's in a valid state. So we're going to do one check on the length of this is log two slot, make sure it's only of length one. Um, we've already said that it must be illogical, so we don't have to check that part. That will be automatically checked. And then we're also going to check um, the, uh, so we're there's going to be a, uh, we're going to assume that there's going to be a run column in this object's column data, and we're going to assume that it's a factor, and we're going to make sure that the number of levels of that factor equal to the, is equal to the length of that. So that's just making sure that um, there's a, a run column, and it is, um, and there's basically, or make, basically we're making sure that there's going to be one, one column for each run. So let's go ahead and create that class. And so this validity method should either return um, a character vector with all of the errors. I've skipped a little bit because I'm only returning either um, one of the errors. Um, but ideally, you should actually return all of the possible errors that you found. So it either returns a character vector of, the, of all of the errors, or it just returns true if the object is valid. Uh, I already did that, okay. Let's see, so as before, I don't really need this. Okay, so here is our constructor for this. Now, I'm not going to go through all of this um, just for time concerns. Um, but essentially, the first part is doing the same thing as before, and then we are doing some several levels of transformation to turn what started out as a data frame into the format that this um, that a summarized experiment um, class object um, is supposed to be in. Um, rather than walk through all of that for time concerns, I'm just going to show you that. And result. 
So I'll create this constructor. And I'm not going to create a show method because we'll just use the summarized experiment show method. So let's create. All right. Okay. Okay, for this one there was a reason I needed the, the dots there. Okay. So let's create an object of this S4 proteomics experiment. So here we can see it prints out and says it's a class um, ProEXP, tells us the dimensions. <laughs> so there's um, 448 features, uh, 232 samples or runs, and we have column metadata on run, pairs, glycosity, subject, and visit, and the row data are features and proteins. So we can use the assays um, method for the summarized experiment assays method to access the intensity matrices. There's actually two of them. So we have, there's actually two, uh, two of these matrices, one of them for the heavy channel, one for the light channel. There's an assay method that lets me specify one of them, which one I want. So that gets us to the intensity matrix where the columns are uh, runs and the rows are the features. I can get the call data for this object and that's just going to be a data frame. So this is using uh, Bioconductor's S4 version of a data frame. And we can see we just have the metadata for all of these 232 runs. And those correspond to the columns of our um, intensity matrix. Then we also have row data. And this gives us information about all of the features. So here we have all of the features feature names and the uh, proteins that they correspond to. So that's how this um, summarized experiment class looks and our proteomics experiment uh, class inherits from. All right, so now we're going to create uh, generic S4 generic versions of our ISLOG2 methods. So because these uh, ISLOG2 generic functions already exist as S3 generic functions. Um, to create S4 versions of them, we can actually just use set generic and give the name of the existing S3 generic. And you can see before, ISLOG2 was an S3 generic function, and we can just um, uh, create an S4 generic version uh, of it, which we can see here. And we'll define methods on these. So the accessor method for ISLOG2 just returns the slot ISLOG2, and we're going to have um, set, and that's using set method. For replacement methods, we actually use a set replace method rather than set method. And note the name of the replacement method includes this uh, assignment operator at the end of it, um, but we don't include that in the call to set replace method because we're using the function set replace method so it already knows that it's a replace me replacement method. Um, and so when we give the name of the function of the method in here, we leave that part out. And here we're just going to replace the islog2 slot. And in this case, we don't have to, we don't have to do any checking to make sure it's a logical or a um, or or it's just length one because that's already part of the class definition itself. We'll create an S4 version of normalize using set method, and this is doing the same thing as before.
and then we want S4 uh, versions of our summary and plot methods as well. Um, so rather than create S4 uh, generic versions of our of the existing S3 generic versions, or did I redo this? I guess. Did I run the uh, stats for package, which is included in uh, default R installations, has S4 generic versions of um, summary and plot. So we're just going to load that package so we can just use those generics. And in general, if you are if you ever make a package and you ex want it to play well with other packages, it's generally a good idea to check if there's any other packages that you are going to interact with that already have um, generic functions that you may want to use rather than creating your own. Um, especially on Bioconductor, uh, that's kind of a big deal because there's a... Um, it can it can turn into an issue if different packages each create their own um, generic functions and they end up conflicting with each other and then it, it can get messy. If you happen to be on the Bioconductor developer mailing list there's been some issues with that and we're still trying to sort exactly the best way to do that. <laughs> Um, but in any case, so there's the, the stats for package has generics for summary and plot, so we're going to use those. If you end up developing a package that you intend to put on Bioconductor, there's a BioC generics package on Bioconductor that just has a bunch of generics for commonly, um, for commonly used generic functions. Um, so you, you would typically want to make sure to include that and use any of those generics if you need. So here we're going to create our method for summary, method for plot, and so we're just using set method and then the function itself is the same as before. So now we have this prot exp s4 class. We can do normalize on it, we can get the summary, and we can plot it just like before. Uh, so any any questions on on these examples? They're all um, posted on the Google Drive. If you want to take more time to look at it, uh, any more questions on these before we move on to building our packages? All right, great. Let me clear my workspace and restart the R session here. Okay, who here has made an R package before? Two people, awesome. All right. For the rest of you, so, um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about building R packages. Um, there's a couple, uh, this is a couple of references um, that are both freely available online. The first is an online textbook by Hadley Wickham, one of the primary developers of all of these Tidyverse tools. Um, he just has an, an online textbook all about creating R packages that goes into much more detail than I'll have time to go into now. And then also there's the um, writing R extensions text um, by the core R team that has essentially everything that you ever need to know about how to um, write R packages and other R extensions from the core R team itself. So first off, um, what are some reasons for building a package? Um, I have a few listed here, uh, so you can easily manage and organize your code. Um, you can portably reuse your code. Um, it provides you a place to have documentation for your code, so if you ever come back much later um, to code and you have no idea what you did, hopefully you wrote some documentation if you turned it into a package, because the package kind of forces you to do that. 
Uh, makes dependencies on other packages explicit. So um, if you ever had to tell someone, oh, here's this R script, and then they're, they're like, oh, that, that, that didn't work, and you're like, you need this package, and then you need this other package, and then there's this other package over here that you need also. Um, so having, having your code in an R package makes all of those dependencies very explicit um, and ensures that they can, they can be installed when people install your package. And then lastly, it lets, allows you to st distribute your code. And that can be either internally just within a lab, within a company, or externally, so you can put it up on CRAN or Bioconductor or just um, distribute it via GitHub or something like that. Um, so let's see. Most of the steps we'll discuss today are specific to R, but there's also a few things we'll talk about that are just kind of generally applica applicable to um, other things like if you're writing something for Python or um, C++ or whatever. And these are just uh, that it's a good idea to organize your code for reproducibility. Um, it's good to write code that obeys user expectations. And we'll also talk a little bit about um, writing documentation and unit tests. I'll show you how to do that in R, but those are also generally good things to do in any other language that you would use as well. Uh, let's see, so a few packages that we'll use uh, today in terms of helping uh, develop and create our packages are uh, DevTools, Roxygen2, and TestThat. Um, and these are all packages that help with the process of developing and authoring packages. None of these packages are actually required to create a package. You, you can just have a default R installation. Um, and you have everything you actually need to make an R package. All of these tools that, um, we're going to, that I'm going to show you are just um, tools that make it a little bit easier and streamline the process a little bit. So the DevTools uh, package, um, uh, that helps with pretty much all aspects of building and installing packages. It makes it really easy to build and install packages. It also has some really useful functions, even if you're not developing your own package. It has um, for example, it has an install GitHub function. If you find a package you really like on, that's on GitHub but not on Bioconductor or CRAN, um, DevTools has a function called install GitHub. You can just give it the, um, the URL of the GitHub repository and it'll install it just like as you would install a pack package from CRAN or Bioconductor. Um, so that's really useful even if you're not cre creating your own packages. Uh, Roxygen 2 is a package that helps um, streamline um, writing documentation for your code. Um, we'll talk more about that when, you get, when we get to documentation. And test that streamlines uh, writing unit tests for your code. All right, so first, um, to get started kind of at the bare bones of everything, uh, there's a couple different functions that you can use to just kind of set up an empty package template that you can start working with. Um, DevTools has one, um, just called the, its create function, and then base R also has its own version called package.skeleton. And these are slight, each slightly different from each other. We'll look at the DevTools uh, create first. So I'll load up DevTools. Um, let's see where I'm at. So here, so when I do this um, create, uh, when I call this create function, whatever, whatever string I pass it, that just is going to become the name of the package. And then in my current working directory, if you run that function, you will end up seeing a new folder that has the same name as whatever you gave it. And if you go in that folder, you'll see a bunch of different files have been created, um, a description, a namespace, a folder called R, that, that's where all of your R code will end up going. Um, because DevTools is uh, made by um, the people at R Studio, um, it also gives you an uh, R project uh, file. If, if you are used to working with R Studio and want to use the R project file, so I'm not going to open that now, but um, that's an easy way to um, manage your project. It also sets up a, a little bit of, um, if you end up using git, it sets up a default uh, git ignore. So these are 
files that you would want Git to ignore. Um, we'll talk more about what each of these uh, different files are, description, namespace, and the R folder are the only necessary ones here. The rest are um, kind of uh, dev tools thought they're useful, but the description, namespace, and R are the, are the ones that it made here that are required. So this is a so uh, DevTools create. This is a pretty minimalist version um, to get you working. Uh, Package.skeleton is quite similar. It's a little bit different. So here, uh, I call it the same way. So I just pass uh, pass it a string that becomes the name of the package. So here I see a new uh, folder was created called Package Template Two. Here I see I didn't get some of those additional files that uh. DevTools create gave me. Um, I still see description. I see a namespace. I see an R folder. I also see a little README that gives you, that gives you some idea of how to get started. And then there's also a man folder. This is where all the documentation will go. So both are fairly uh, minimalist. Um, one thing that one feature of package skeleton that DevTools create does not have is if you happen to have uh, an R script already saved and you have a bunch of functions uh, in it that you want to become part of the package, um, you could just run that R script um, so that you have all of those functions in your global environment. And then you could pass package.skeleton a list of the um, functions that you want to end up in that package. And package.skeleton will automatically um, put that R code in the R code, R code folder for the package. Um, and by default, uh, package.skeleton will actually put all of the objects in your global environment uh, into the package. It assumes you want, it assumes you want all of those, so um, that's one thing to be aware of. All right, so now that we have an idea of how to get started, Let's take a closer look of the structure of an R package. So an R package is really just a directory with uh, certain required files and subdirectories. Um, so the directory layout of an R package looks like this. Um, the topmost level, you just have a folder that is the name of the package itself. And then inside that folder are a bunch of um, other folders and files that are all important to so you have a description file, and this is just a structured um, text file that gives a description of the package. Um, this namespace file, um, that imports package dependencies and exports your functions and classes. We'll talk more about that later. Um, the R folder is just a folder where you put all of your R code. So um, pretty simple. You just have a bunch of uh, files in there that end in .r and um, whatever code is in there, that will basically end up as your package. Um, the man folder, this is uh, documentation of any exported R functions and classes. Um, there's an optional source directory, so if you happen to have any compiled code in C, C++, or Fortran that you use, that's where that will go. Um, there's an inst uh, folder that stands for installed. And so this is a folder where any miscellaneous files um, that don't really belong in any of the other directories um, will go that you want the user to have access to when they install your package. Um, so <coughs> inst stands for installed, so these are any additional files that you want essentially installed and available to, your, to the user um, after they install the package. And these will be moved into the um, top level um, package directory when, they get, when your package gets installed. Um, there's a data subdirectory, and this is just um, R data files that have whatever um, data sets you want to make available. Um, usually use, really useful for examples and vignettes and that sort of thing. A tests uh, folder that has all of the unit tests for making sure your functions and classes work properly. A vignettes folder, so vignettes are um, really useful. They're written in either R Markdown or Sweeve, and they're basically these uh, walkthroughs of how to use your package with lots of illustrative examples. Um, and 
they're really a, a major um, hallmark of our packages and what I, something that I really like about them as opposed to some packages um, in other languages since R makes it really easy to have to make it so that most packages have some sort of walkthrough that shows you exactly how to use the code and that sort of thing. And then optionally, you might have a, some sort of news file that um, gives the log of changes for your package. Um, lots of these folders, files and folders, are optional. So the minimum that you actually need to have a working package are just the description, uh, the namespace, the R subdirectory that has all of your R code, and then also a man subdirectory that has all of your documentation for that, um, for that code. So R, R will build and install a package um, that only has a description file and an R subdirectory, um, but the minimal requirements for a proper package really include the namespace file as well as the um, documentation in the man folder. So here's a little more of a look at some of these uh, packages that we're going to use to um, to automate a few pro a few parts of the package building process. So DevTools, as I mentioned, this kind of helps streamline essentially all aspects of the um, process of building packages. Um, it allows you to build, check, and install packages from within R. Um, you're used to installing packages from within R, but building and checking packages is usually only uh, possible at the command line um, outside of R. Uh, it also offers convenience, funct convenience functions for adding common development infrastructure to packages. So for example, if you have Roxygen 2 um, documentation, you can use the DevTools document um, function to generate that documentation. Um, Use, or if you're using test that for unit tests, um, this will set up a template for you. If you want to add a vignette, um, DevTools can set up a template for your vignette. If you want to use RCDP for, um, for writing some stuff in C++, uh, DevTools makes it really easy to set that up as well. Uh, Roxygen 2, so um, if you're familiar with um, uh, Doxygen, it's a, it's a um, it's a tool used in many other languages for generating uh, documentation from code commons. It's used a lot in C++, Java, Python, um, and other languages. Um, Roxygen 2 is R's uh, version of Doxygen. So the idea behind this is um, typically you would have to write the documentation uh, separately from the code in a format that's kind of similar to LaTeX. Um, the idea behind Doxygen and Roxygen is that it's a good idea to keep the documentation for your code actually nearby the code. Um, so Roxygen 2 lets you um, write structured code comments right next to your functions, and then it automatically generates the uh, appropriate R documentation from those structured code comments. It'll also gen automatically generate this namespace file uh, from those same code comments. Um, and we'll talk about this more when we start discussing the uh, documentation and namespace files. Um, and then test that is just a package that provides some convenience functions for writing unit tests. Um, there's other packages that exist for that same purpose. Um, one of them is called RUnit. I'm sure there are probably others. Um, and we'll talk about that more when we get to unit tests. OK, so um, this next part is. Um, yeah, we'll talk, we'll talk about this. So uh, let's, I want to talk a little bit about how packages actually work um, and the process of actually building and installing them. So any package can exist in five different states. Um, it can either be a source package, a bundled package, a binary package, an installed package, or an in-memory package. So the source package is the simplest. The source package is just a directory um, on your computer or someone else's, um, just a directory um, with that structure that we talked about previously. So it has the name of, the, the directory is named, after, um, has the same name as the package, 
It contains a description file and a subdirectory called r that has contains r code and so forth. A bundled package is just a source package that has been bundled and compressed into a single file with the extension .tar.gz. Um, typically, anything with this extension, you, people will often call it a tarball. Um, all of the files and directories in a source package have been reduced to a single file using the Unix tar utility and then compressed uh, using gzip. So you end up with a single uh, compressed file instead of a folder. Um, so that's the main difference between bundled and source packages. Um, people will often call bundled packages source packages as well because they're just compressed versions of a source package essentially. Um, and you can make uh, bundled packages either on the um, command line um, with our command build or from within R using the DevTools build function. Um, binary packages, um, so typically when you install a package uh, from CRAN on either Windows or Mac OS, um, a binary package is what you're installing. Um, for a binary package, the R code in that R subdirectory has been parsed, evaluated, and the output has store, been stored in uh, .rds files. So basically the code has been converted into a binary format that's really fast to read and load. Any compiled code in the source directory has been compiled to binary executables um, for the respective operating systems. So source packages, I mean, excuse me, binary packages are specific to their operating system. Um, they only exist on Mac or Windows um, because Linux will typically just install packages from source. Um, and then any documentation and vignettes have been converted to HTML and PDF already. Um, also, the contents of this install directory have been um, moved already. So you can create these binary packages either on the command line with command, r command install dash dash build or with devtools build binary equals true. Again, these are uh, specific to your operating system, so, um, so you can only make a win, uh, Windows binaries on a Windows machine, you can only make Mac binaries on a Mac machine. Yes? <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, lots of times on CRAN or Bioconductor, you might get a message when you're trying to install a package that says, uh, this uh, source package is newer than the binary version. Do you want to install it from source? And, um, and yeah. So, both of the, so if possible, um, it's totally fine to install it from source. That'll typically download the bundled version of that package and then try to install it from source. Um, the main issue that you may run into sometimes with that is, um, is you, actually, you do need to just make sure you actually have the tools to install um, the, the package from source. If there's no compiled code, so if there's no C++, C code, or Fortran code, then it's perfectly easy and you don't need any additional tools besides R itself. Um, if the package has compiled code, um, so C++, C++ or Fortran code in it, then you need to have the appropriate compile, compilers and stuff um, installed so that that, can, that code can actually get compiled. Um, but yeah, it's always, it's always fine to install a package from source um, if, if it's newer. Um, and you can also um, forcefully install a package from source. Uh, let's see. So when you do install that packages, there is a uh, type argument. Um, typically, you're not going to specify this, but you can specify type equals source, and that will force it to download the source package and install um, install it from source, compiling any code that needs to be compiled, assuming you have the appropriate compilers. Um, and there are sometimes cases where I needed to do that. It's not very common, but every once in a while you'll have a package that relies on some semi-obscure um, command line tools or 
other compiled code, and sometimes the binary version that's available um, links to the wrong ones or ones that are incompatible with your machine or something. So sometimes if you have uh, if you have a package that uses some sort of compiled code and it's not working on your machine or can't find the appropriate um, the appropriate uh, libraries on your machine or something, sometimes you can fix that, um, assuming you have the appropriate compilers, by making that install from source and making sure they link to your appropriate versions of um, whatever tools they happen to be using. Um, so that's a binary package. Um, so this is a just kind of a description of what happens to each of these um, files and, dir and directories between source, bundle, and binary packages. Uh, I'm not really going to go through this, but it's kind of, it can be useful. Uh, so an installed package. Um, so this is so this is typically what you have sitting in your computer when you don't have it loaded into R or anything like that. So an installed installed package is a decompressed version of a binary package, essentially, that has been saved into a package library. Um, and what I mean by package library, uh, despite the confusingly named library function in R, so typically when you go to load a package in R, you, you do that using the library function. Um, but but uh, R packages are not actually R libraries. Um, the notion uh, you took, uh, a library in R is not a package, but rather a collection of packages that you have installed. Um, and you typically have you typically have two libraries at any given time. You typically have one library for all of the default packages that come with R, and then you typically have at least one additional library for all the packages you've uh, manually downloaded and, and installed. Very often, you'll have more libraries for each for each version of R that you have installed in the past as well. Um, and I, yeah. So sometimes I've seen our script where they load packages using libraries mm -hmm. and others that use source. Is there a difference between you two? Uh, source does not load a package. What source does is it just runs and all of the all of the code in an R script. Is that is this the Function, this source function? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so source uh, does not load uh, a package itself, I don't think. Um, at least I've never seen it used that way. Uh, what source does is it just basically, um, you point it to a, uh, an R script, so a file ending in .R that has R code, and R will parse and parse all of the code in that and run all of that code. So that's what source is doing. So typically, you might so you might have some sort of so I can imagine a package might have some additional R script that it doesn't necessarily want um, evaluated as part of the package installation process. Maybe it's sourcing that R script, um, or people people typically use source just um, often when you start uh, writing lots of your own R code. You might you'll end up with a, a long R script with lots of functions that you use a lot, and instead of arranging those into a package, people commonly just use source on that R script to load all of the functions that you want to use. Um, so that's where source is typically used. Um, I'm, argu I'm arguing it's a better idea to create a package to organize your functions, but there's nothing wrong with just using source, assuming that's working for you. Um, I thought this question was going to be about require. There is another uh, function called require that also loads uh, a package. Um, and the only difference between library and require is um, require um, is a little bit more friendly programmatically. Um, so typically, if you have, um, if you want to uh, load a package inside another package or inside some sort of, some sort of R code rather than just interactively, um, you might have a uh, require in there instead. And we'll actually see a few examples later today where I use require to load a package instead. Um, yeah, so you typically have two, at least two libraries at any given time. One reason I bring that up is, and this is something that 
I've run into a few times in the beginner's intro to our session is sometimes people will, will um, have uh, work computers and their default directory for saving things is like in the cloud or something where, where they don't have write permissions or something like that. Um, and so sometimes when you try to install a package in R, it'll try to install it to a directory that you don't actually have permission to write to. And you can change the, uh, the location of the library that you're using. So um, again, library is just basically where your packages get installed. Um, so you can change, when you do library, you can give it a directory to a different, um, you can give it a, a, a directory that you want it to install those packages to instead of the default location. All right, and then lastly, there's in-memory packages. In-memory packages are just um, installed packages that have been loaded into memory during an R session. Um, one thing I want to note is that a package may be loaded into memory but not be attached to your search path. Um, so. Technically, what library and require do is, let's see, let's load dplyr, is it both loads the package and then it also attaches it to your search path. So search is a function that just brings up your search path. It lists all of the packages that are attached to your search path. Um, and what this basically defines is the order that R will go searching for functions when you use their names. So here, uh, dplyr is the first thing on my search path after the global environment. And that means if I use the filter function, um, that I, I will find the dplyr version of the filter function if I just do, if I just type filter. Um, Stats is further down my search path than dplyr, so if I want to get the stats version of filter, I have to fully qualify that name with the name of the package, um, colon, colon, uh, the name of the function. So stats filter is what I would have to do in this situation if I want to get the stats version of filter. So what library technically does is it loads the package and attaches it to your search path. It is not actually required for you to use library to load a package. Um, so let me restart my R session. And I don't know why I have, I have so many packages loaded by default, but um, so if you do session info, there's a function called session info that just um, prints out a bunch of information about your current R session. It'll give you a list of attached uh, packages first, and these are the packages that are actually attached to your search path. And then it'll also give you a list of packages that are loaded via a namespace and not attached. So these are packages that are actually loaded into memory, but are not on your search path. And you don't actually need to use the library function to load a package. So all you actually need to do is use a function from that package, and the package will be automatically loaded. Um, so say I want to use the filter function from dplyr. Well, I don't have dplyr loaded or attached right now. Um, but if I wanted to use the dplyr filter function, then I can actually do that. And now, if I go to session info, is dplyr loaded yet? Uh, I guess I need to actually call it. Um, oh, oh yeah, thank you. Yeah. So now that I've used a, now that I've used a function from dplyr, dplyr has been loaded into memory. Um, but not attached to my search path. So dplyr is actually loaded 
but if I want to use any functions from it, I have to fully um, qualify their names with the name of the package and then the name of the function. Um, so that's just one thing to note is that you can have lots of packages loaded but not necessarily on your search path. Just because you haven't loaded a package with library doesn't mean it's not loaded. Um, all right, so the workflow for how you go about actually building packages, um, going from a source package to loading the package into R, um, there are three required and two optional steps. So uh, typically, you would build a bundled version of your package, um, usually with R command build. But if you have dev tools, you can also just use the dev tools build function. Um, optionally, you can check the package with the R command check uh, command line utility, or you can use the dev tools check function. And um, what R command check does is it checks the package for common errors, any problems with it. It checks all of your documentation, makes sure your documentation is correct and in order, checks your R code, makes sure your R code is actually um, works, or well, not works, but can be, evalu can be parsed and evaluated. Um, checks for common problems in R code, makes sure your namespace and thing and functions that you've exported and imported, imported and exported are all uh, working properly and that sort of thing. It'll run all of the unit tests in your test folder um, and check any vignettes, make sure they can be built, etc. Um, so running R command check is a very good idea, and to uh, get a package into CRAN or Bioconductor, they have to pass R command check without any warnings or errors, usually. Um, once you've built a bundled version of the package and checked it, um, then you can install the bundled package with R command install. Um, and DevTools install is a little bit different. It actually works on the source version of the package rather than the bundled package. If you're using the command line utilities, you would typically want to build the package and then install it. If you're using DevTools, you can skip straight to install. Um, and then if you wanted to build a binary version of your package for some reason to give to someone who maybe you have C++ code in it and you want to give it to someone without a compiler. Um, of course, you have to have make sure you have the same operating system and stuff, but um, you could do that. Um, one minor note is that uh, binary packages are actually built by just uh, installing the package uh, from source and then compressing the installed version of the package. Um, so binary packages are actually, you actually install the package before you can create the binary version. Um, and then finally, of course, uh, in a new R session, you can load and attach the package just with a call to the library function. So uh, as mentioned, DevTools automates many of these steps. Um, so DevTools has functions that do all of these from uh, within R, so you don't have to keep going to the to a terminal. <laughs> um, so DevTools build builds uh, bundled or binary packages. DevTools check will build and check your package. Install um, builds and installs a package. So Dev, if you use install, you typically just use that on the source package rather than a, um, a bundled version. Um, and then DevTools also has this load all uh, function, which which claims to build, install, and load the package. It doesn't actually do that. It kind of simulates the process of doing that. Um, it's meant for uh, for uh, rapid iteration and testing new code while you're developing a package to uh, to see how things would go if you actually took the time to build and install and load your package. Um, but because it simulates some of the steps and doesn't actually do them, then uh, it, can, it doesn't necessarily catch, it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily exactly the same thing. And you can't use it to actually build and install your package. But it can be useful if you're um, in the process of developing one and testing things. All right, so uh, to learn about package, de package development, I created an example package that implements those S3 and S4 classes that we uh, talked about earlier today. So there's this uh, protxp package in the folder for um, this lecture right now on Google Drive. Let me see. So in the folder for this lecture on Google, Google Drive, you should see a folder called protxp. 
Um, so if you want to get that, I recommend just downloading the whole folder instead of trying to download all of the files individually. And so I have this Pro.exp package. Um, you can see it has a description, a namespace, a folder for R, tests, vignettes, documentation, and data, and so forth. And so we'll, we'll kind of go through each of the necessary parts of a package and look at this uh, example package uh, for examples. So first things first, and we're just essentially going to work through, walk through um, each of the uh, elements of the, this um, package directory structure. Starting off with the description file. So the description file is just a text file that lists various attributes about the package. Um, a typical one looks like this, so it'll just have a um, some sort of field, colon, and then um, a description of that field. So package, name of the package, title, and more descriptive name of the package. Um, most of these are actually important and matter. Um, of course, things like the title and description, you can write whatever you want, but um, things like version um, are important. Uh, there are different ways of deciding like how you want to decide when to bump a version and how you want to use version numbers and that sort of thing. But um, the version number is important so people can go back and find the correct version of the package that they were using to make sure everything they do is reproducible. Um, defense imports and suggests, uh, these are fields that will talk about a little bit about what they mean later on when we get to namespace, but depends is essentially a list of packages that must be loaded and attached um, whenever you load this package. So whenever you lo um, load this package uh, via the library function, any packages that are listed here in, in the depends will be um, loaded and attached first. Imports are any packages that your package is used and must, uses and must be loaded but they don't necessarily need to be attached to the user's search path. Um, and then suggest these are packages that are used by your unit tests um, in, in vignettes, possibly in examples, but aren't actually needed for the core functionality of your package. And then a uh, license, so whatever kind of license you want. Of course, um, give yourself some credit for writing one, for writing the package. So as an example, uh, the description file for this pro.exp uh, example package looks like this. The name of the package is pro.exp. Um, the title of the package, an example package for geometric experiments. Um, uh, defense, so these are the packages that will be uh, loaded and attached each time this, uh, this package is loaded. Um, these are imports, these are packages that this package needs, but don't necessarily need to be attached. Um, suggest these are packages that this that are used for vignettes or tests or examples, but aren't required for the core functionality of the package. So I can you can see that. So here is uh, that description file. All right, um, code. So the R subdirectory contains all of your code in various R scripts. You can arrange those files essentially however you want. Um, it's a good idea to keep it organized. Um, so here in this package, we have this R folder. It has, uh, I just organized it into three different R scripts. One for the S3 uh, examples, one for the S4 code, and then one for some other things that we'll talk about later. So a few things to remember about the code in this R subdirectory. You can essentially arrange them into however many or as few R scripts as you like. Um, but um, all of the R code will be evaluated when the package is built, uh, not when it is loaded into R by the user. So for example, if you want to have a startup message or something like that, um, you can't just put the code in there and expect it to work. You have, there's, a, there's special, um, special 
things that you need to do for that. Um, if you have, say, uh, want to get like a timestamp of something, that'll um, so you use the date function in your in your code there. That'll be the date that the package was built, not the date that it was installed or loaded. Um, all of the code in this file and or in these um, scripts will be evaluated in an environment that will become the namespace of the package. So um, all of this code will not be evaluated in the global environment. It will instead be evaluated in a new namespace, and that namespace will become uh, the or in a new environment, and that environment will become the namespace of this package. And we'll talk more about namespaces in a bit. Um, any R objects, including uh, functions that you assign in this R code will not necessarily be visible to other users of packages unless you specifically export it in the namespace. And we'll talk about how to do that when we get there. Um, and so all of this code should mostly be functions, methods, and class definitions, and so forth. And we'll go ahead and take a look at some of this R code um, when we get back from a sh uh, short break for refreshments, because it's 10.30, and so, um, we're going to uh, break for a little bit so, and get some um, refreshments. <laughs>